Mr. Kathy? Sorry, I forgot in the song, I got taken away. <laughs> That's great. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. And uh, Father, for this worship hour, and we just want to ask that you would um, bless our sister Donna as she presents, that you would just anoint her, um, and that you would give her the words to speak. And that each one of us, Father, would hear the message that you have specifically for each one of us. And maybe not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hold on. I'm just looking at these little icons at the top. Um, is there a little icon that I can hit to see chats or no? No, I guess not. I have a hard time when I'm in the slideshow doing it. I think there's probably a way to figure it out, but it's um, we'll just like that. sometimes okay. it'll pop up and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. When you um when you open up your presentation, if you hover over the place where you can bring the menu down where you can say mute and stuff, under the more under the three dots, you can get to the chat. And if you click on that. Like uh, Sister Elaine said, sometimes it comes up and sometimes it doesn't. But if you uh, if you have the icon down at the bottom, the little video camera for Zoom, there's yeah. usually two uh, boxes. And once you after you click up on the chat and you click on the other one, it'll pop it up in there, and you could okay. put it on the side. Well, you know what? I'm just going to make this easy. Anybody who if there's any questions, anyone can read it so that I don't have to worry about it. Okay. Just thank you. I, I consider it as a privilege to be able to teach the flock and to be able, another privilege to be able to learn God's prophetic ways. And I thank you um, for, for all of you, each and every one of us. It's a pleasure and it's a, a privilege to have a family that has a desire to know God's heart and his prophetic truths. So anyway, I chose this... Um, this particular series, it is a series, and I'm, I have been convicted that I need to do the whole series, and uh, it is on pro uh, parables, and um, Elder Parminder has, his, uh, has it on his website as highly recommended, and so I just feel that it's a really good study for us to review, as well as I think it's gonna be a really good teaching tool for the Levites, when we go to them. And um, so that's why I chose this. And I, I've been just blessed. Um, try to, I try to make it simple, as simplest as possible, because that's the only the way I, that's the only way I learn. So anyway, we can get started. The nature and property of the parable, part one. And also too, Parminder did this um, last year around Chris, uh, no, 2019, around Christmas time in France. For those of you who have been familiar with our studies, over the past two years, you'll notice that the methodology that we are focusing on is that of parable. Is there somebody want to say something? For those who are not accustomed to understanding how parables work, you might think that it's a very basic or even childish approach. However, what I want us to see is that the use of parables is an extremely powerful technique. The reason why Adventists in general think that it's not useful is because over a hundred years ago, our understanding of morality and prophecy as Adventists have become two separate ideas. 
we would approach them either as moral or prophetic issues. And keeping those two concepts separate has molded us to have a certain way of thinking as we move forward in our studies. It's not just our random thoughts that have brought us to this place. Often when you read either the Bible or spirit of prophecy, the way parables are discussed or introduced, they've always seemed to have a moralistic perspective. It makes it very difficult for us to get out of this way of thinking. I want to make it clear that the moral understanding of parables is correct, and we don't deny this. So when you see a parable such as a shepherd losing a sheep, depending upon the application that you're making of that parable, it's an indictment or an accusation leveled at the shepherd that they haven't taken much care. The parable of the woman with her 10 coins is clearly a story of carelessness. This woman representing the leadership of the church, the owner of the house, loses the coins. It's not the fourth of the coin that gets lost. In fact, the coin does not even realize that it's in the house and that it's lost. And he's talking about the parable of the lost coin, which is Luke 10, 8 to 15. We can therefore have a moral understanding of what that means. Our focus is not to understand parables on a moral level. It's to understand parables on a prophetic level. The spirit of prophecy teaches that this is a treasure. This is light that has been hidden. And this hidden treasure needs to be dug up and understood. Does anybody have any questions, any comments? Yeah, so I, I have a question. How, oh. So can you go back? Yes, more, more back. Back, back to the previous one with the treasure chest. Okay, the treasure chest. Okay. Okay, so it says in the top paragraph, it's not the fourth of the coin that gets lost. Yeah. Um, I think it's supposed okay. to be coins. That, Points? I think we're, well, Dave, I'm thinking it's supposed to be fault. No, you know, it's I, not the fault. Over that over, and I couldn't, um, it was hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And even when I went back to the. I have, I have that sometimes happen too. Uh, I couldn't. It's it, like one word that you can't figure out. I thought it was point. It's not the point of the coin. I don't know, maybe that's wrong too. In point, fact, the it, coin it, does not even realize that it's lost. Yeah, it could be the fourth, <laughs> but it sounded like it's not the fall of the coin. So, or anyways, I, I, that just confused me because I'm going up the fourth of the coin that gets lost. I tried looking at, I tried going on the Google transcripts, and even the word was not. It didn't. It didn't. It, I don't know. But so, come on. I kept listening to it over and over. That, that, the fourth of the coin that gets lost. Yeah, I think it, it's not the fault I of. Don't know. The, well, the coin that it gets that it's not the fault of the coin that it gets lost, something like that. Because it doesn't even realize. Yeah, you know what it could. It does not realize. That, that makes it textual. <laughs> Sorry. How do you spell fault? F A F A U L. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you know what? That makes more sense because I was, you know, my mind was like. I couldn't, I could I just couldn't get the word. And that was making a big difference. And put, and put it in there that, that it gets lost. Yes. It's not the fault of the coin that it gets lost. You're right. Because it's it makes more sense. It, it sounds good. And, yeah. and contextually it sounds because in fact the coin doesn't realize it's that in it's the house and that it's and that it's right. Right. Is it, cool. is the oh. 10 coins referencing the 10 commandments? No, th this, this was about sin. Um, this particular, it's about uh, somebody being lost. The coin is a person uh, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the woman, oh, the, the church, the house. And, you know, uh, it, it's like the priests or the, the people who are in charge of the church. 
the coin was lost. The person when the person didn't even realize that they were lost, and the carelessness of the church not being diligent to making sure that that coin was never lost. But anyway, something like that. Yeah, thank you. That was the moral of that particular story. I know I that that whole thank you, thank you for helping me because that word was I I couldn't find the word and even on Google transcripts, I, the, the word didn't even make no sense. But now it makes sense. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, sister. Well, I thank my husband because he says it stuck for some reason that stuck in his head from watching the video and oh, good. So it's well thank you he's, he's thank you david he's not much of a speaker <laughs> <laughs> see we we can't we can't do it without each other you know what someone has some somebody else has you know so anyway okay in order to understand morality it should be clear to every single one of us that you do not need to be a christian whatever your religious persuasion even if you're an atheist all human beings understand morality. We all understand how to behave and treat one another. Most of the governments in this world are secular governments and they frame laws to ensure that society works properly. Those laws that, are, that they frame are not framed with a religious bias, yet they teach every single one of us how to treat each other correctly. The difference between a Christian and other religions is our understanding of the great controversy. It's an understanding of how sin entered into the world and how it's going to be dealt with. That's the difference between a Christian's worldview and either a secular or another religion's worldview. Anybody want to comment on that? So we really, I always wondered about this, you know, how, you know, the world, they know all the mor moral laws and, they, and, and, and much of the world keeps them, but yet they're not Christians. Some of them may not have even known the Bible. And I always was fascinated about that. I thought, why was that? Now we have a really good idea why. However, they don't understand the deeper understandings. There's one more component to being a Christian. It's the availability of power from God, the power to deal with our sinful lives. And we have done many studies in this movement on that subject. However, this weekend is a weekend about prophecy. If you want to understand prophecy, you need to be able to understand how to read inspiration correctly. If you look, if you could turn to the book of Luke 10.25, this part of inspiration is really important. There's a question between a lawyer and Christ, and sometimes we call these lawyers scribes. Often our understanding of what a lawyer or scribe is in the time period of Christ is very shallow or very wrong. Again, we have done presentations on this subject of who a scribe or a lawyer is. There's a lawyer that's going to ask Jesus a question. The question is, how to receive eternal life? Jesus responds in a very unusual way. He says, your relationship or your understanding with the law, how do you understand or read those words? When Jesus asks this question, he's not asking whether or not the person can read. What he's really asking is, with those few words that everyone can read, how can this lawyer understand what they mean? This issue strikes at the very heart of Christ's ministry at his first advent. And it has troubled many people before Christ's first advent and since then. So let's read Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It says in English that he tempted him. There's no negativity in this dialogue. This is not some kind of satanic temptation that the lawyer is having with Jesus. He's not trying to deceive or trick him. It's a genuine question. Jesus responds in verse 26. 
He said unto him, what is written in the law, how readest thou? This is the key question. What does the law say and how do, how do you read those words? This is a question that's found throughout inspiration. Besides this story, there's another famous story that we are all aware of that's got the identical dynamic. It's the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We all know this story. This man's problem is not that he can't read, just like the lawyer, he can read. He can read all these words, but the problem is that the Ethiopian does not understand what he is reading in Isaiah. Anybody have questions? This is our problem too. We can read, but we don't understand. We know when we study inspiration that all of those stories were written for our admonition or our understanding to assist us or to help us. When you take the concept that all of the story, stories from the scriptures are there to help us, the Bible defines who us is. It's these people upon whom the ends of the world have come. Then what we are required to do is to not just take one story. Perhaps we'll look at Daniel 3. There's a beast and his name is Nebuchadnezzar. And he creates a statue, a copy, an image, or whatever you want to call it. He makes an image of the beast and he tells everyone to bow down to that image. It's a worldwide phenomena. We understand that it's a story connected to the Sunday law at the end of the world. However, there are many other stories, some obvious such as Daniel 3 and some not so obvious. All the stories are written for our understanding, us being the people who live at the end of the world. It's obvious that we're supposed to read all these stories and try to understand what they mean for us today. They all have a moral component, but they also have a prophetic component. They are there to teach us what the end of the world will look like. If you take that correct understanding and you begin to apply it, you'll know that the story we're reading here in Luke 10 and also about the Ethiopian unit, they're all stories that we need to understand at the end of the world. As Adventists, we understand that the book of Daniel, which contains many prophecies, brings us to the end of the world. In fact, if you were to read Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. But why is he given this dream? Daniel tells him why. He says, you are thinking about what? What was Nebuchadnezzar thinking about? Daniel tells us he was thinking about what was going to happen in the latter days. The latter days is in reference to the end of the world. We know that the prophecies of Daniel, not just da Daniel 2, but all of them, bring us here to the end of the world. Perhaps the most famous one you're aware of is Daniel 1141. It says at the time of the end, which is the end of the world, if you were to read Daniel 2.28, this is the verse that we've been referring to. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. Nebuchadnezzar is wondering what's going to happen in the last days. It's the purpose of that vision. We just referred to Daniel 1140, and we knew the phrase time of the end is referring to the end of the world. Because if you went to the very beginning of chapter 11, Daniel begins to lay out the prophecy of the beginning to the end. This is the continuation of the thought found in Daniel 10. Let's go to Daniel 1014. We said in Daniel 2 that God is going to show Nebuchadnezzar about the last days. Daniel 1140 is about the time of the end. And if you go to the beginning of chapter 11, 
where the story begins, you'll see this, see this relationship between Daniel 10.15. This is what Gabriel says to Daniel, and we'll paraphrase. I've been sent to teach you what's going to happen at the end of the world. The fulfillment of this vision, this story, or this prophecy is not going to be fulfilled for a very long time. This means that the fulfillment is far into the future. We know that it's not just the stories, the visions, the prophecies that we can use from the book of Daniel to help us to understand. It's also the life of Daniel that has significance for us. It's not just the dreams and vision he has. It's also his very own life. That's important for us in our day, Daniel's life. In Daniel 1, he is taken captive into Babylon, and this is a real life story, a literal story. What do we do with this story, with this story? The Bible teaches us that all of these things were written for our understanding. Therefore, we should understand the story of Daniel's life. This capti his captivity into Babylon teaches us something at the end of the world. I'm sure we all understand, even if it's just a basic understanding, that these statutes on this, these two charts, which are taken from Daniel 2, is a story about the kingdom, the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Depending on how you count, there are four kingdoms. It begins with Babylon at the head, and it ends with Rome at the feet. It was taken straight from Daniel 2. But if you went to Revelation 17.5, which is a story about the end of the world, the artwork is shown with a woman riding the be a beast. If you look at this woman, on her forehead is written the title, Mystery Babylon. This short explanation teaches us that when you look at Daniel 2, it begins at the top of the image or at the beginning with literal Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar, and it ends with Rome. However, when you come to the end in the imagery of the book of Revelation, the end of the world is portrayed by a woman whose name is Mystery Babylon. So we know that Babylon is here at the end of the world, but it's a mystery. The reason that it's so mysterious is because it's not so easy to understand. It's a spiritual phenomena. And you and I know, who can understand spiritual things? The Bible teaches that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And that means you have to be a spiritual person to understand these spiritual phenomena. The reason it's a mystery is because most people don't understand what it means. They don't understand what it looks like. This is an important principle for us to understand. Any questions, comments? We have Mystery Babylon at the end of the world. It begins with literal Babylon and it ends with Mystery Babylon. The reason why it's so mysterious is because nobody understands what's going on except those who are spiritually minded. If we go straight to Daniel 2, and go to Revelation 17, we have a story that's a parable. You go from literal or natural Babylon to spiritual Babylon, from the beginning to the end. If we understand it this way, then what does the literal story of Daniel become? A spiritual story of Babylon. Therefore, we can take Daniel's captivity into literal Babylon, and what do we see? We see a parable. Not his visions, not his dreams, but his very life. The story about his life in Babylon, the literal story, or the neutral, natural story, is written for our understanding. It's going to teach us about something at the end of the world. There's going to be some form of captivity into spiritual Babylon. Therefore, Daniel becomes a symbol or a representative of God's people at the end of the world. Remember now, it's Daniel's life that applies to us at the end of the world. I'm in Daniel this last several weeks as well. And it's really, um, 
it's opening up more and more from understanding the way that we do of getting into his life, his actual yeah. life. It's his actual life that, that really pertains to us. Mm -hmm. Very important for us to understand Daniel's life. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, again, we can all understand that. Often what we do as Adventists is that we're very keen on health reform. So we take the stories of Daniel 1 and we see his interaction with the king. And we see that he and his comrades become leading people in the kingdom. The reason they become so famous is because of their faithfulness before God. How is their faithfulness exhibited? Does anybody wanna add anything to that? How is Daniel's faithfulness exhibited in his, and his comrades? In, in, uh, his good character. Yeah. We all know the answer to that. They refuse to eat from the king's table. Mm -hmm. We understand that story to refer to the health reform message. Ellen White speaks about this subject quite extensively. All of this we know is true. So by them, you know, keeping that health reform message and in, in in refusing to eat from the king's table, that's what set them apart. And showed their faithfulness. Yeah. That showed their faithfulness to God. I was thinking as well is, is here he is. I mean, when we compare to, um, try to compare to ourselves and our walk that, you know, all the questions of, of how to be, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the words to put it in, in, in our conservative walk, thinking that, that, that we have to, we have to uphold, I'm, I'm trying to think of the words to say this, so I'm going to say it probably wrong, but maybe you guys will get it, but to uphold our faith in our secular world, in our secular jobs, and yet there was a distinction, it, and it's like this distinction between not um, merging of church and state, also not merging your work and your religion, your, the, your work, to do your work faithfully to the, to the job, and that's what I've always seen Daniel as, he did his job in Babylon with excellence, that was glorifying God. Yes, and he did it in, in, in front of the world, right, right, world but they saw him, and they just knew that he was a, he was favored by God, even the kids, even it wasn't because he was telling anybody that you can't eat any of this stuff and you can't drink any of this stuff and you have to do this and you have to do that. It was because he did all that he did, all he put his hand to, he put all his might into, if that's the way to say that. And he was a living, living testimony. Right, a living testimony. The world. However, I would like to ask you a question. Do you really believe that Daniel was literally 10 times more clever than everyone else, including all of his teachers? Most Adventists would say, of course, because the Bible says it. However, let me ask you a question. If you're a teacher or you're, you've taught children, will you ask them a question to assess how clever they are? How can you make that assessment unless you already know the answer. So what he's saying is, Daniel couldn't have been the most clever and the smartest because if he was, everybody else, whoever was assessing him was just as clever. So I have two children and I set before them a test. One can answer three questions and the other can answer six. Who's more clever? The one that answers six questions. How much more clever is this child? From three to six answered, what have we just done? We've doubled it. So what could we say about this child? He's twice as clever than the other child. How would you know that he's twice as clever? You know all the answers. You have to be at least as clever as that clever child, don't you? Otherwise you wouldn't have known that they got all six answers correct. Often we don't think about these things. Nebuchadnezzar is going to test those men. How does he know that they are 10 times more clever than their teachers? How does he know that they are answering the questions correctly? What would that teach you? What does that teach us? That Nebuchadnezzar must be 10 times more clever than the teachers. 
because Daniel could give an, any answer and Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't know if, if it's correct or not, or would he? For him to know it, it would have meant that he's 10 times more clever too. And what food is Nebuchadnezzar eating? He's eating from the king's table. I'm not attacking a moralistic understanding of that story, but it's silly to think that if you become a vegan, you'll be 10 times more clever than the meat eater. It just doesn't work that way. And I remember I used to think sort of like that, you know, that, you know, if I didn't eat meat, that maybe my mind would get sharper and I'd be smarter. It does to a certain level, but not, not extravagantly. We know that there's a story behind this and there's a point to be made. I'm not denying at a health level or even at a moral level, being faithful to God is good. However, we need to understand what that story is teaching us at a prophetic level. Was Daniel and his comrades the most clever people in the country according to that story? Yes, it says they are 10 times more clever. Let's hold on to that thought. So these people who are symbols of God's people at the end of the world, hopefully we can all see the connection. Remember now it's Daniel's life and his comrades life that applies to us at the end of the world. Literal Babylon equals spiritual Babylon. Literal Daniel equals spiritual Daniel. Daniel is God's people. So he's going to have superior understanding because he's faithful. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. When Daniel gets to Babylon, he's going to go through an operation. What kind of operation does he go through? Does anybody know? They make him a eunuch, don't they? He's turning into a eunuch. Do we all understand what that means? He can no longer have children. Why do we think this happens? Does anybody know why this happens? No, children to represent the last generation. It's to keep the throne safe. Mm -hmm. However, we want to understand the spiritual significance of this. That's why they made him a eunuch because they wanted to keep the throne safe. Wow. But there's a spiritual understanding of it. A, uni a eunuch is someone who can't have children. It also refers to a man. In the Bible, it doesn't call women eunuchs. What are women called? What are women called that, can't, that don't have children? Virgins. They're called virgins, yes. Virgins are women and eunuchs are men. The symbol of a eunuch is someone who can't have children. Do we understand about family trees? You have a grandfather, a father, there's you and then you have children. You have four generations. If you were a eunuch, how many children would you have? None. If you were a eunuch and your last name was Smith, when would your family line end? You. With you, because you're a eunuch. So you must be a final person in that family tree. We would call it the final generation within that family. If we take that understanding and say that Daniel is a eunuch, therefore he's a symbol of the final generation, which means of course, someone who lives at the end of the world. Is Daniel clever? Yes. Does he understand everything? Yes. But we need to understand this prophetically or spiritually. So we're going to say that spiritually speaking, he understands all the spiritual things that we need to understand and remember. He's a eunuch. Can we think of another eunuch? I already gave you the answer five minutes ago. It's found in the book of Acts. And where is he from? Anybody? Another eunuch, famous? Ethiopia. 
Yes, Ethiopian eunuch. So what proof text? The eunuch from Daniel and the eunuch in Acts, are they the same people? Are they? Are these two, two different eunuchs the same people? What do we think? Spiritually. They are both symbols of God's people at the end of the world, yes. Say amen if you agree with that or if you believe in line upon line, amen. This Ethiopian eunuch is the final generation at the end of the world, but what's his problem? How much does he understand? Nothing. He doesn't understand anything. So you have someone who understands 100%, which is Daniel. Then you have someone who understands 0%, or Daniel or Philip. They are both symbols of God's people at the end of the world. I really want us to think about that because this is at the heart of the problem in God's church today. I have a comment. Yes. He, he was willing to learn. Yes, he was the eunuch. Yes, you have to. And we and and we we really do need to be teachable. We really do, because this whole thinking spiritually is different for us. It, it doesn't come natural for us. This is not a natural way of teaching us. We don't think this way naturally as human beings. So we really do have to train ourselves to think spiritually. You have too many people who are not like Daniel. They are more like the Ethiopian and they don't understand what they read. This is important because we think that all of us are like Daniel, but in reality, too many of us are like the treasurer and we don't understand what we are reading. It's not that he doesn't understand the language. It's that this eunuch doesn't understand what he's reading. That's what our problem is today. And this was the problem with the lawyer in Luke 10. Therefore, Christ tells him a story. The story that he tells was a real life event. It really did happen. And we know what that story is about. Someone is traveling from Jerusalem. He's on a mission and he gets attacked. Who attacks him? Some robbers attack him. We can understand this morally as Jesus gives that perspective as well as Ellen White. They both give this moral perspective. We can understand it that way, but we can also understand it on a prophetic level, which is what we are supposed to do. But too many of us don't do that. If you were to understand this on a prophetic level, then there are these robbers and this person that's just been robbed is he a Jew or a Gentile? He's Jewish, so he's God's people. We're in Luke 10 and God's people have been robbed. If you go to Daniel 11, who is this story about? In Luke 10, there are two people or two groups. There are God's people and the robbers. That's one story. Now we'll proof text and look at another story. What are we looking for in Daniel 11? People and robbers, which verse? Verse 14. And in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Talks about the robbers and the people. And it says that there's a vision. These people, which people? The robbers. What are they going to do? Establish the vision and they will fall. So we know that when you have a story about people who rob God's children, it's connected to a vision. In the verse, it's a de definite article. It's the division, it's the vision of Daniel 11. What does this teach us? That the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10 is a story about what subject? What subject do we think that story is about, the Good Samaritan? End of the world? 
the vision and of what book and what chapter. And you're right, it is the end of the world. Daniel 11 is the vision, and now it's being spoken about in Luke 10 through the story of the Good Samaritan. We know this story well. There are three men or three groups, priests, Levites, and Samaritans. What is this story about in these three groups? It's the vision of Daniel 11. Hopefully we can all see this by now. Can we see that God's people, the Ethiopian eunuch, and most of us today don't understand what we're reading? It's the same problem that the lawyer has. All of inspiration is dealing with God's people at the end of the world. In Luke 10, 26, this person wants eternal life. He's a lawyer and supposed to understand how to explain inspiration or the law. He asked Jesus, how can I receive eternal life? Jesus responds, he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? In other words, you have the law and you can read. You tell me what you think it means. Then he proceeds to tell a story. And he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. The lawyer responds and Jesus says, good answer. And he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He tries to justify himself because he asked, who is my neighbor? We all get the story. We can all understand it morally. However, we are not going to address it moral morally. What we want to see is that it's an issue about how you read inspiration and depending on how you read determines whether or not you will receive eternal life. Now this is really important how you read because it's eternal. Even if you don't understand it in detail, you know that a lawyer is an expert in the law and he doesn't even know how to read. Just think about that because we all think that we understand how to read, yet we are being shown in the story that we don't understand how to read. What's the issue in the literal story? What is the lawyer saying? What is the lawyer really saying? When he says, who is my neighbor? He asks a question, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? What did he mean by this? What he's really saying is that he doesn't understand the relationship between God's people and the world. He seems to think that he is superior to the world, that the world can never really teach him anything. Has that arrogance. This becomes a significant issue when you take the stories and add them together. Because what we want to do is go back to the story of Daniel, not his vision, but his life. Daniel is a eunuch, which makes him a symbol of the final generation. He's not 10 times more clever than his professors because the person that's assessing him is who? It's Nebuchadnezzar. Is Nebuchadnezzar 10 times more clever than the professors? No. We need to understand the, the symbolic meaning of this. We are not doing a study on eating if you eat from the world or eat from God's table. Because we should already know, according to John 6, who is the true bread? We're thinking spiritually now. Who's the true, true bread? Jesus. It's Jesus. We should all know that. Jesus is the true bread. So the story of Daniel, when he refuses to eat from the world's table and only eats from God's table, it's a spiritual story. 
You are free to make a childlike or simplistic literal application if you prefer, or you can even make a health application. But this story was supposed to be understood with a spiritual significance. Here's a eunuch that understands spiritual things. There's another eunuch who like the lawyer understands nothing about what he's reading. There are many things that we can glean from these stories, but what I want us to see is that one of the things that challenge, that's challenging us today as God's people or Adventists is that we don't understand Luke 10, 29. What don't we understand? What did the lawyer not understand? Who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? We don't understand our relationship to the world. You would think that we should understand that. Daniel understood it because he knows what table to eat from. The Ethiopian eunuch doesn't understand and this lawyer certainly doesn't understand. So Jesus tells him a story. It's about three people, two from the church and one from the world. He's going to teach you if you're a lawyer who is your neighbor, your true neighbor? Is it the person from the church or the person from the world? The biblical story is clear. Remember, we're not dealing with this morally. We're dealing with this prophetically. It's the world that helps and assists the injured person and the robbers. Which verse did we go to? Daniel eleven fourteen, the robbers of their people. It's dealing with the vision. So when we talk about the priests, the Levites, and the Samaritans, what subject matter is this? It's the vision of Daniel 11. It's a story about repeats and enlarge upon itself as you go from Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and then papal Rome. How many is that? Four. There are four repeating stories, and each one tells you about the end of the world, culminating in verses 40 to 45, which is the last six verses. As it says in verse 14, the establishment or fulfillment of this vision is based upon the relationship of the robbers and the people. You also know that Luke 10, the story of the Good Samaritan, is the story of the establishment of Daniel 11. This is a relatively easy way to see how significant it is to understand parables on a prophetic level. Now I'd like to put that thought to one side. I would like to introduce to you another idea. The New Testament can be divided into a number of different ways. I would like to suggest that it can be divided into two parts. If you went from Matthew to John, those four books, you will see that they are a, the story of God's church from the birth of Christ to his death and then from his death to the commission to go to, the world, to all the world and give the gospel. Let's go to Matthew 28. It says, go to all the world to, to teach, preach and baptize. That's the first major division of the New Testament. Then you go to second, go to the second, let's go to Colossians 1.23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. The point to, that we want to make with this verse is that the gospel is going to be given to the world. It becomes a fulfillment of Matthew 28. The first few chapters of the book of Acts are dealing with the story of the church. It gives an introduction of how the gospel goes from the church to the world. There are three progressive issues. These are the four gospels, and this is the book of Acts. And there is an overlap. The book of Acts begins in what year? What event just happened, which is the death of Christ? It takes you from 31 AD to the stoning of Stephen. It's the first few chapters of the book of Acts. 
The rest of it is how the gospel goes to all the world. If you look at the structure, it's a story about how God is going to interact and deal with his church. The four gospels take you to what year? They all take you to the year 31 AD at the cross. However, there's a commission to give the gospel to all the world. In the book of Acts, the first few verses take you from the cross, then to Pentecost, and then to the stoning of Stephen, 34 AD. Then the gospel goes to the world. What I want us to see is that a cursory perspective of the New Testament is a story about the gospel that first goes to the church and then to the world. I've got the book of Acts here with all the epistles of Paul. They're all repeating stories of how the message went to the world. The very structure of the New Testament divides into two portions, the church and then the world. Where does the four gospels end? At the cross. Then the book of Acts begins where the gospel ends and it brings you to the stoning of Stephen. You know as well as I do that Pentecost is the conversion of 3,000 people. Were they Jews or Gentiles? They were Jews. So we know that the story of the church as given in the New Testament is in two parts. The disciples, whether it's the 12, the 70, the woman that followed Jesus, or the 120 people at Pentecost. It's all contained in this history right here. Then the gospel is going to be given to the church in a second stage from Pentecost forward. This is the story of Saul and his conversion on the road to Damascus in 34 AD. Then he's given a commission to give the gospel to the world. We can see that the very structure of the New Testament is in three parts, two in the church and one in the world. This is the repeating story. It's the same story in Luke 10. In Luke 10, it's called priests, Levites, and Samaritans, these three groups. We already saw in Luke 10, what subject is it? It's Daniel eleven fourteen, 14, which is the vision. As I've, joined, as I've just shown, the four gospels themselves end in what year? What year? Four gospels? 31 AD. Yeah, that's right. This is the story of the church, part one. And if you overlay Luke 10, it becomes a story of what group of people? What people is this story about? The disciples? The church? The priests, yeah. The perspective of the four gospels that we want to understand prophetically is not that priests should be good people. All of these four books are a prophetic explanation, explanation of how you and I should relate to God on a prophetic level. You know that the disciples had a big problem with Christ. What was that problem? Anybody know that problem that they had with him? They wanted him to become king on earth. Right. They did not understand what he was teaching them. They had a wrong or false because of their training in the church. This is a story about you. You don't understand your relationship to God. This has nothing to do with whether you're good or bad. This is about your role, whether it's in the first advent, your role of giving the gospel to humanity, or whether it's a second at the second advent. It's the same issue. Your role is giving the gospel to humanity. But the problem is that we think we know what we're doing. However, inspiration teaches us that we don't know what we're doing. The priests are the worst people out of these three groups. If you go back to the story, just on a moral level, they are the worst. Therefore, we should understand it on a prophetic level because they fulfill the same role. We don't understand who we are and what we're supposed to do because we have a problem. We can read, but we don't understand. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. Lord, as we begin to see ourselves in inspiration, may each of us take these thoughts and ideas personally. This time together today with you, may we spend this time contemplating on these issues. We ask that you would change us, that you would mold us into the image of your son. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's it. It, does anybody have any questions about this is you know we're, it's constantly we're learning these parables and we have to put ourselves in there we have to constantly remember that these parables are us and and we're having to put ourselves in there instead of going back to the historic or the moral, moralistic understanding of it so does anybody have any questions or any comments they might want to make was this helpful? Yes, so very helpful. Thank okay. you. So good to hear it again. <laughs> How was this helpful to anybody? Mm -hmm. Anyone can explain that. I just love that that um, there's there's a lot of things that I have learned, especially uh, I think I have seen this presentation, but when when you uh, put it down on the um, you know in a in a presentation like this, and you see all the words, you can go back and. Uh, read and uh, it, it becomes so much more clear and you pick up points that you missed before. Yeah. Thank you. This is beautiful. Yes. Amen. All I know is for me is that I kept realizing and looking at, you know, priests, that's us, you know, and the, all these problems that these people had in these stories, we have those same problems. And um, it's just, a, it's, a, it's an amazing way to look at it. It's, we're having to look at it. We really do have to put ourselves in there. And um, it's this, this, this story and this message, this parable, it's for us right now, specifically for us. Uh, the, this, this parable was created for us. Our time has come and it, we're, we need to be ready. And what this parable is teaching us and, and the other parables that go along with it, the four different stories, we're not ready. We're, and that should scare each and every one of us that we're not ready, but we need to be ready. And we have a few months. <laughs> Get ready. If that makes us feel, you know, even more unsafe and unsecure, because I mean, we do, we do really do need to pray um, about our mind. It's uh, thinking spiritually is uh, such a different concept. When I was a Protestant, thinking spiritually had a whole different meaning thinking spiritually um, and it delved into, you know, the unknowns and things, but this is really thinking spiritually is understanding what God meant this parable to mean to us, to equip us so that we're ready for the work that 6,000 years have brought us to. We have such a huge job because God put this together from the beginning of creation for this very moment and that's that's humbling so amen i look forward to the next part amen okay let me just pray just a short comment yes Mr. donna yes i i love this study and oh a real blessing i'm just going wow wow and um what i'm seeing my whole interpretation of daniel <laughs> in Babylon mm -hmm. you know it was the diet the diet thing we were so focused on that we're always so focused yes well that's all I ever knew with it yep it was Daniel in his diet and maybe the statue yeah that and was giving us some education on you know what was coming from the different uh uh nations but it, nothing is though nothing like what God wants to teach us now. And nothing, that. we never really focused on his particular, his very life, his, his walk. His, yes, exactly. You know? Yeah. Well, other than the fact he was smarter than the king. Yes. Because he, you know, they came up with this test on the food. Mm -hmm. And he appeared to be, and his, and the worthies, his friends, had a much better diet 
and because they were smarter, they were wiser, because they ate the diet that God gave them. Yes. So, <laughs> but the story isn't about that at all. No. The real story that God wants to teach us is to be prepared for the end of the world and um, going to the Levite. Yep. <laughs> oh, I need to know so much more. Yes. To really understand, yeah. you know, God's thinking here. And, you know, like how we were talking about earlier about the diet thing and how, you know, sometimes we can just get a little bit caught up with it and, and it becomes, it becomes all consuming. And it was never meant to be that way because that was not really the, the, the parable was not that purpose of, of, you know, just become all consuming. And then you end up like, you know, John Harvey Kellogg. And he yeah, went, exactly. He went totally off rails and he was totally into this utopian kind of, you know, world with people, human beings could be completely healthy and have no disease. And I mean, you see how that can just go totally out of, out of control. You oh know? yeah. Completely away from the whole uh, center of where God wanted it to go. Yep. And they're still stuck on all that. Yep. So yeah, it, uh, this was beautiful. The way your slide show too was very good. Oh, so simple a child can understand that you know that's what i like you know because me i'm a child and i want it simple where if i show it to somebody that just doesn't know anything that it needs to be simple that a child yes, exactly be like wow this is cool you know because yeah, that's what i think that's the only way i think yes well we're all children mm -hmm. in our understanding especially i mean we're open to learn of course we are, but you know, why do we make it so complicated? Yes. Instead of this sim simple, simple truth of what God is showing us. Yeah, and then for me, when it gets too complicated, uh, it, I, I get lost. It just, I can't, you know, I used to be able to juggle and I used to be able to do like 10 things at, at one time. I can't do that anymore. I gotta really focus on what I'm doing. Yes, amen. I think that's part of, you know, the transformation and, and all that, you know? Yes. Amen. Half, Amen. Half the time you're doing things, you don't even know how you got there, what happened or what, you know, you can't even remember to trace your, your, your footsteps or, or, or how you even got there. Yeah. And then you get to one place and you go, God, I don't even remember getting here. Is that not the scariest? <laughs> thing? Okay. No, that's true. It is lunchtime. Um, so let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any more questions or comments? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. This is such a blessing. I just give you all the glory, uh, all the praise, Lord. Um, I consider this a privilege, Lord. I consider this a privilege to be here at this time in history. And it's such a humbling thought that we have this great opportunity this great commission at the end of the world. This is what the angels are watching closely. And I must say, in many ways, we're not ready. We don't understand. Help us, Lord, to understand. We can't do it without you. I know it, we're coming into a harvest and um, sometimes we get ourselves all caught up thinking it's gonna be, we have to do all these things and we have to remember that the Levites are being harvested and that there are people who see, help us to use simple tactics, simple simplicity, like we're talking to children. Help us never to think that we know everything that we're so arrogant to think that we are God's chosen people. Because at any moment we cannot be and we have to know that. Help us to always have the picture of Christ in our hearts. For he really was and is God in the flesh. He didn't have to come here like he did. He didn't have to humble himself the way he did. He is such an example to us. 
let us never think this wisdom and this knowledge that we are given, this precious gift, let us never let it get to our heads and think that we are better than anyone because we're not. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for the, the parable for Daniel, and the Good Samaritan. Thank you for Elder Parminder for his such superior way of teaching. It reminds me of Christ. He truly does teach like Christ does. Thank you so much, Lord. And I pray um, as we go to lunch that we would, we would contemplate on these thoughts and these lessons and think of, of these parables prophetically and spiritually, Lord. Help us to be more spiritually minded. Help us when we read these, these stories that we've read all our lives never ever seeing the treasure, never ever unlocking the truth. Help us to see it renewed now. Now that you give us a little bit of truth and now that you're guiding us with your very gentle, kind hand. Thank you, Lord, and I pray these things. Bless the food and bless those who have prepared the food as we eat and contemplate on these precious truths. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen, Sister amen. Donna. Thank you, Sister.